this particular video, we're going to review all the main characteristics of Hermitian operators and why they're so interesting, you know, to model our physical world, in particular in link with the um, um, Hilbert space vectors. So, let's go. I've said it in a previous video, but this is an important statement, uh, so I'll say it again. Uh, what we call a state in quantum physics is different from a state in classical physics. Uh, in classical physics, you know, the state of an object, well, is just, you know, the list of the properties that you can measure at any time. So, yeah, you know, pretty simple. Now, in quantum physics, uh, it's different. In quantum physics, um, there is a thing called the pure state, which basically is composed of all the information available for that state. However, in quantum physics, there are two types of pure states. Um, there is the omega state uh, from which uh, you can measure, just like in classical physics, the exact value of uh, an observable property. While for some other states, you know, which are not omega states, well, you cannot observe and you cannot measure uh, omega while you are in that state, you know, for various reasons, maybe because you already measured something else in that state and that made it, um, you know, move to another state or whatever. But what you can do is to get the probability uh, to be in a given omega state the next time you will make a measurement, okay? So, to summarize, in order to be able to experimentally measure uh, an observable omega, uh, the object must be in an omega state for that observable. And uh, for a given omega, there are n omega states, you know, which correspond to the n possible values that can be measured for that observable. And we will note them like this, you know, here. So, how do we model a measurement? In other words, how do we find in the math world the isomorphic counterpart of a measurement in the physical world? Well, you know, when we measure an omega, we assign a real number to it. You know, that's how we say we measure omega. So for an omega state, uh, psi j, we need to find a mathematical function that will give us the real number value of that observable, you know, omega for the object which is in a psi j uh, state. And for any other state, we want to define all the possible values that could be measured from that state, you know, changing to an omega state, where the likelihood uh, to go from the current state uh, phi, for instance, uh, to each possible omega state uh, psi j. And what that means is that there is a likelihood lambda j here uh, from phi to get to psi j. In other words, in quantum physics, <laughs> states are uniquely defined by their likelihood to go to each different measuring state, you know. So basically, this means that quantum physics is deterministic, <laughs> as opposed to what you hear. Well, but there is some probability stuff, and we're going to see that too. Um, so uh, if we define the states as being vectors, this looks exactly like defining a basis, you know, uh, this, this kind of, of, um, of equation here. And so we can define, you know, the states, the pure states, as element of a Hilbert space, you know, that we defined before, with a norm equal to one, and which defines a unit of measurements. Now, all pure states can be represented as unit vectors. You know, that's that's our conclusion for now. Now, let's define an operator, you know, m omega for each observable omega, such that when applied to a basis vector, in other words, one of the uh, omega states, uh, it multiplies a vector and therefore its amplitude by the value of the observable that will be measured, you know. And so, for each measuring state psi j, we should have something like this, you know, m omega applied to psi j is equal to vj times psi j. In other words, you know, the psi j would be the eigenvectors for the m omega operators, and the vj's will be the eigenvalues. And that implies that the norm of the vector given by m omega is equal to the corresponding measurement of the observable omega. 
Now, remember that Vj is a value that we actually measure, you know, in the physical world, and therefore it's a real number. So, you know, although we're dealing for now with complex numbers, this particular value is a real number. So it's basically equal to its complex conjugate, you know, it's the same thing. And we also want that any state, uh, you know, follow this rule here, this equation that we've seen in the previous slide. Now, let's see how we can achieve that. Uh, but first, uh, let's have a little math interlude. Uh, in C, you know, each complex number has a complex conjugate, you know, and it and is defined like, like this, as you probably know. Now, in Hilbert spaces, you know, which are vector spaces defined over C, there are linear operators uh, which can be represented by matrices, uh, of course, if you have a basis, which transform vectors into other vectors, you know, just, just like that here. Now, by definition, the, the Hermitian conjugate of an operator U, which is called, you know, U star, well, I call it U star, uh, but this is a dagger, you know, uh, but I call it U star because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit lazy. Uh, so you, you can view the, the Hermitian conjugate as an extension of the notion of complex conjugate to operators. For instance, you know, if U is defined like this, well, its Hermitian conjugate will be defined like that. Now, and this is where things become interesting, you know, an operator U such that U is equal to U star, you know, is equal to uh, its Hermitian conjugate, is called a Hermitian operator. And as we'll see, the Hermitian operators have very interesting properties. Also, uh, we can define another type of operator called unitary operator, uh, such that you know u u star is equal to the identity. Now, knowing all that, uh, we can apply a fundamental theorem regarding Hermitian operators. What this theorem says is this: when defined over C, you know, like in the Hilbert spaces we're talking about. Well, the Hermitian operators, again, vectors make up a basis of vector space. <laughs> Plus, their eigenvalues are real. Hmm, how's that? That's quite interesting, you know. So Hermitian operators, you know, define the states, uh, which are represented by their eigenvectors psi j, from which we can define all possible states, you know, just, just like that, which is exactly what we wanted. And now, if phi is a measuring state, well, it is equal to psi j, okay, which is an eigenvector of the Hermitian operator, so just like this, and where vj is the uh, the eigenvalue, you know, the, the the measured value of omega. And in other cases, you know, non-omega states, uh, phi can be represented as this sum here, as we just saw, and in which case we say that this state is in a superposition of states, which is a bit confusing, you know, and caused a lot of trouble, especially when we looked at experiment like the double seed experiment by Young or uh, the thought experiment by Schrodinger, you know, with this cat being both dead and alive at the same time. <laughs> well, all of this is described in another video from this series, but at least now you know what Hermitian operators are and how we can use them to be isomorphic to what's really happening in the physical world. <laughs> so fascinating.